So if you move to Ecuador, the food will be all natural, wholesome, pesticide free, no steroids, no antibiotics. I'll be much healthier. True or untrue? Let's see. Here's your story, let's begin. The water's fine, come on, dive in. The future's here, it's right before your eyes. So even though I did a lot of research, talked to a friend that's from here, lived here, um, I didn't realize to what extent the food source here is contaminated. Now, in the U.S., and I'm going to get lots of hate email over this video. You know, I don't care. Truth is truth. In the U.S., it's brought up all the time. Oh, it's so unhealthy. There's steroids. There's antibiotics. There's uh, dangerous pesticides, etc., etc., etc. And except for the pesticides, I'm not really going to say that's not true. Because we all know that those kind of things go on. But what we also know is it's regulated. And because there's a certain amount of regulation, when you go to the store, you're going to find markings. You're going to find, you know, indicators. And if you want to be sure that you get good eggs and good tomatoes and good beef and that sort of thing, you can buy that. It'll, it'll be marked and you're going to pay more, but the food's available. And so, yeah, if you go in and get the cheapest eggs and the cheapest, cheapest beef and that sort of thing, then you're running that risk. And if you do a little research, you can find out that you could be poisoning yourself. Possibly. Here's the problem here in Ecuador. The regulations are spotty at best. Now, in 2010, I think, um, it's been a while since I looked at this, been a year since I looked at this. I think it was around 2010, Ecuador uh, made an agreement, signed a pact, I, whatever you call it, with the world to say that the most toxic um, chemicals would not be used. And that sounds all well and good, except it didn't, ban all chemicals and there's no real research and enforcement there's not um, any kind of government agency that um, checks batches of food and that kind of thing so and the food sources come from so many different i mean tens of thousands of different places it's kind of an impossibility anyway so well as a matter of fact it was just a year or two ago that they've been looking into this problem with potato farmers up around Quito uh, that have been poisoned. And it turns out they've been poisoned by various chemicals and fertilizers that they've been using there. So here's the problem here is, let's say you go to the Mercado, you go to the big outdoor market in summer indoor, but you go to those markets and it, Looks like it's coming right from the farm. And guess what? It is. It's coming right from the farm. Many, many, many different farms. As many people as you see selling those wares, you're going to have farms that they came from. And you don't know how they grew it, and you don't know what they put on it. There's almost epidemic problem in this country of parasites and amoebas. And where do they come from? They come from basically using raw sewage to fertilize food. And you can treat them and that sort of thing. And it's okay, um, except some will actually absorb that into what you eat. But that's an issue you have to watch out for here. Why? Because it's not controlled, it's not regulated. There's chemicals that's sprayed on food. Um, you don't know what those chemicals are. They can buy them freely here. And they're aware, the farmers are aware that nobody wants to eat chemicals. And so more often than not, it's, oh, no, no, I don't use any chemical. But you don't know if they're using chemicals or not. A lot of people are using chemicals. That's why all Ecuadorians wash their food, for example. 
you know, why would they do that if there wasn't a problem? Of course there's a problem. And so whether it's steroids, whether it's antibiotics, whether it's chemicals, you have no idea what you're getting. There is no labeling. There is no enforcement agency. And those things are used. Is it used on every piece of food you pick up? Who knows? And that's the point. Who knows? Now, I've been here for a while, and I've made concerted effort to find out, and I choose food best I can from places where it's probably going to be okay. Now, what you get through Super Maxi is probably sourced out fairly well. Do I know that 100%? No. But I know that they are so big and so image conscience, conscious that if, if they stumbled in that area, it could essentially put them out of business. And so I rely on that market pressure to cause them to do a little bit better job when you go to the Mercado. You don't have a clue unless you know where that's coming from. Now here locally, I found out a few vendors that get their food right from Yungia Valley. Of course, not everything is. A lot of things come from Peru, Peru. A lot of things come from the coast. It depends on what it is you're getting. And so let's say you have a vendor who you know their local food is is a good source, it's, it's good to eat, you know that. But they're carrying bananas and you have no idea what's going on with those and they're carrying mangoes and you have no idea what's going on with those. So it's, it's a bit of a crapshoot and so you do the best you can. But I wanna, I wanna get rid of this notion that when you come to Ecuador or many other countries it's thinking because the food looks so unprepared and rustic and it still has dirt on the potatoes and that kind of thing, that that means you're getting back to nature and it's going to be good and healthy. And it's absolutely not true. And it's actually more difficult to find good, safe food sources here than in the United States, where at least there's a concerted effort for labeling and that sort of thing. Now we know that if those labels were fudge, it could put a company out of business. So they're gonna label that stuff. So, that being said, I do wanna give you a couple food tips. Another beautiful day. I've mentioned before about um, you know beef and pork and chicken and uh, cheeses, dairy products, you know those kind of things. So I want to run down a couple things on how to get good food. First of all, let's talk about the beef. The beef, as I've told you before, it's basically old, worn-out dairy cows that no longer produce. They climb up hills to chew on their grass like mountain goats. And so their, their muscles are tough, their tendons are tough. You know, so when you, when you eat that, you know, you're kind of fighting. Now, some restaurants, it's a different story, but you're not a restaurant. So let's talk about the beef that you can buy and you can get. Beef is not popular here, mostly because it's not, it doesn't taste very good. It's less expensive than pork, for example. There's not much of a market for it. It doesn't have a good taste, but here's how you can dress it up. First of all, they don't take blue skin off. Now, if you don't know what blue skin is, you can look that up on foodnetworktv.com or whatever that is. But you need to cut off the blue skin. There's a fat layer, like you'll see on meat or on the outside, and it's usually on top of that blue skin. You wanna cut that off too, because the worst bad taste you get is coming from that fat layer. And so I know it's counterintuitive. You want to have some fat. There's no marbling. You cut that off. You got nothing. But there's bad flavor in that. And so you cut off the blue skin. You cut off that fat layer. 
Now you got a piece of meat that's, you know, it's just red. You're going to want to put some garlic powder. You definitely want to put some tenderizer on it. You want to marinate it. You want to, you know, let it soak for a few hours, that kind of thing. You want to treat that meat. Create a tenderness with it. If it's any kind of a roast or that sort of thing, um, definitely you're going to want to pressure cook that. But if it's not, then barbecue that on the grill if it's treated and it's okay. I mean, it's not going to be right home to mom, but it's going to be like a really cheap cut of meat. It's going to be a little chewy, but it won't be bad. So that's one way to get around, you know, the beef. Now, I don't know about you, I happen to love spaghetti, all things Italian, sauce, pizza, that kind of thing. So I'll make my own. You can't buy a good spaghetti sauce. I, you know, there's a couple that maybe will marginally pass and you're going to spend for a little jar, a little jar like that, maybe six, seven, eight dollars. That's not fun. So you get something that doesn't taste very good, it doesn't go very far, and you, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money on it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so tomatoes are cheap. Garlic is cheap. Spices are cheap. So you get a whole bunch of tomatoes and you throw a bunch of garlic and tomatoes in a pot with a handful of oregano and you let that cook and cook and cook and cook and then you mash it down and you let it cook and cook. If you're real energetic, you can actually uh, blanch the tomatoes first, pull the skin off, and then throw them in. I do that sometimes, sometimes I don't. And you let that cook for a number of hours. I just got through making the batch. I'll make a batch every so often, probably at least once a month. And then I, I let it cool down. I put it in the plastic Ziploc bags. I put it in the freezer. So I've got um, probably eight meals worth of delicious spaghetti sauce sitting in my freezer. So that's how you get around that. And it's relatively inexpensive too, to do it that way. You definitely want to do that. Now, are you going to find Pomodoro tomatoes or certain? No, it doesn't matter. Just find good tomatoes. It's going to taste good. It's going to be delicious. And it will beat all the hell the sauce in the jar. Tomato sauces, all of those things, they've got this weird taste to them. I don't know what the heck, you know, I guess in some parts of the world they have different taste buds or something. It's just not very tasty. And I see all the time on Facebook, on websites, people asking about it. So it's not just me. So that's an issue. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind. When it comes to cheese, hopefully we're going to alleviate that because of a trade agreement with Europe that's gone through and over the course of this next year, they keep, they're going to be pulling tariffs off. And one of the things in the, this first go round is tariff on cheese. And I actually found, although it's not there anymore, um, a blue cheese from France that was delicious but I can't find it again. But these things are going to start coming through. The local cheeses here, unless you're getting um, certain, like mozzarella, you can find some good ones. But the cream cheeses have an odd taste. Learn to make your own. Uh, a lot of the milk has a, has a funny taste. A lot of the butter has a funny taste. So you're going to have to hunt through and find the brands. Now, Super Maxi brand butter, for example, is not bad. And that's the one I get. It's not delicious, but it's not bad. So if I cook with it, it doesn't, it doesn't contaminate the taste of the food I'm cooking. So uh, you have to learn to find these things. I miss cream cheese. I miss cheddar cheese. I, I miss a good blue cheese. Um, it's just the way it is. So part of your experience here will be to find substitutes for the things that you you took for granted. Um, so I can make my own dough. I can make my own sauce. I can find decent tasting mozzarella cheese so I can make my own pizza. It's really not a problem and it's absolutely delicious. It's killer. It's better than any pizza I'm going to get in town. So that's how you find your way around it. You're going to learn to cook. 
Check this out. It's 15 minutes later. Burr. You can eat out every day, but you want to be careful. Now, the last thing I'm going to say about food, and this will really get some people going, but the Ecuador diet here in the mountains is not a healthy diet. It's not an original diet to the people here. Rice is a relatively new development in the Andes. You know, where it used to be potatoes and corn, rice has really come in. It's plentiful at stores for a very long time. There's reasons they have it. it they don't grow it here, but it's imported. It comes in and it doesn't have the best of um, qualities for health. But if you look at the diet that they eat, everybody talks about the Almarzo, the lunches that are two fifty three dollars But you want to be careful of those because you're going to get a plate, and this, would, this is not unusual. It comes out, and you're going to have a big pile of rice, and there'll be some French fries, and there'll be mote, which is a kind of a cooked-to-death kind of a hominy corn. It's all carbohydrates. And you'll get a little piece of a half of a leg of a chicken or something and practically no vegetable. If the vegetables you get are maybe like pickled red onion and just a little spoonful. Those lunches are not healthy. There's just as many fat people here in Ecuador as there are in the United States. Except maybe Walmart. But my point is, you can have a good healthy diet, you can have good food, you can have good tasting food, but you have to learn it, you have to work it, you have to put some effort into getting it, you can't assume it. You have to be careful about what you're eating, where you're eating, that sort of thing. And if you do that, you're going to be fine. But you need to know that when you come, it's just, you can't just go to the market, grab everything and think that you're getting good healthy you know, clean food. It's just not the case. So with this information, I'm not saying, oh, don't eat here in Ecuador and the food sucks. And, and I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is take control of yourself, take responsibility for yourself and make it happen. It's here for you to do that. So um, let the hate emails begin. Could be larger than life, bigger than the world. Living out the hopes and dreams of every boy and every girl. You could fly higher than the sky, shine brighter than the stars. You could have all you ever wanted. Shoot the moon and reach for Mars. You know you could. You know you could